Hello, and welcome to the National Book Festival. My name is Monica Valentine from the Library of Congress, and I'm here with Kwame Mbalia, whose featured book at the festival is Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky. If you'd like to see Kwame's presentation at the festival, log into nationalbookfestival.com. You'll find it on the children's stage. Welcome, Kwame. It's good to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm pleased and thrilled beyond belief to be here. Great, great. Well, we have a lot of people in the room, so let's begin our conversation. Just one minute. All right. So your most recent book, Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky, what inspired you to write it? Uh, I've always wanted to write a story um, that involved the characters that I grew up reading and listening to um, when I was young. There were four of us, we shared a bedroom. And so to kind of get us to wind down, you know how kids can be at the end of the day, you know, they're fighting, they're yelling, he's touching me. Um, we, my parents would put on Anansi Tales on a cassette player and we would listen to that to fall asleep. And so I've always wanted to bring those stories forward. Um, but Tristan is also a, Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky is also a story about dealing with grief. And about six months before I started writing this book, my father passed away. And so in writing this story, I got to um, use, not use, but I got to work with Tristan and help him deal with his grief as I and my daughters and my wife were coping with the grief of, of losing, you know, someone that we loved. And so it, this, this book came along at exactly the right time. Wow, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, we have a question from Taylor. How many books are going to be in the series? I am working on um, book three right now. That is the Tristan trilogy. Um, I haven't come up with a good term. There, there need, there's a good smush term, there, a Tristilogy or something. I haven't worked on it yet. Um, but this is the third book. Um, it culminates in the end of this arc of Tristan's story. Um, if, Disney, if Rick Riordan Presents said, Kwame, we need another three books, I would happily write them. But this book three that I'm working on right now is, is the end of this current arc. Okay, okay. Can you tell us a little bit about your road to becoming a professional writer? What inspired you to do that? Who or what? Um, there, there, there are two um, avenues that kind of came together here. The first is that I've always written. I never thought that I would be an author, a published author, but I've always written because writing is the is how I knew the best way that I could express myself, you know, get my feelings out there, um, whether I was shy or dealing with something that was too difficult to talk about. I could always put it into a story. Um, that is how I could confront a lot of obstacles and challenges in my life, was putting it into another person and having that person in that story deal with those challenges. Um, so I've always written. I've written, you know, poetry, bad poetry. I've written uh, raps, bad raps. Um, and I've written lots of stories. Um, but it wasn't until I joined an online writing group uh, and had someone tell me that, hey, your writing is really good. Have you ever thought about becoming an author? And truly to that point, I hadn't. But after they said that, after that external validation, that's when I thought maybe I can make a, you know, a, a, a journey out of this, a career out of this, um, an attempt out of this. And so that was five or six years ago, um, which just goes to show you that there is no set age upon which you have to become or you're, you're due to become a writer or you failed. You can, you know, become an author at any point, any stage in your career and in your life. It's all about that motivation that you have internally and sometimes that external push that you get. Great, great. Okay, we have a question from Krista. She wants to know what goddesses are going to be in your second book, if you could share that. Krista, asking the top <laughs> question. Um, I'm trying to uh, not give too many spoilers, um, but I think there's a, there are two yeah, okay. So there are two that, that I, I, I hold really close and really dear. And I'm going to save those two for the book because I want them, I want you to come upon them naturally. However, there's a character that I created for the book. Um, she, you won't find her in any 
uh, folk tale or any uh, other story except for this one. And that is because I wanted to create a character um, that embodied the spirit of one of my favorite singers, which is Nina Simone. So I created a goddess uh, who is called Lady Night. And Lady Night um, runs a, uh, a little jazz club um, and she helps Tristan fix something that is very near and dear to him. Um, but she's totally inspired by Nina Simone, um, the way that she sang, the power that she held in her, in her songs, because songs are just another form of story that are told. And so I thought it would be important to put that version of a storyteller into the book and you will get no more spoilers from me. <laughs> well, that sounds really exciting. Um, Marie has a question. Who are your heroes, Kwame? Uh, and are we likely to see more books from you about those figures? Who are your heroes? Oh my goodness. That's, uh, do, we don't have enough time to answer that question. <laughs> who are your heroes? Who are your heroines? Um, uh, it would be cruel and unjust to me if, and a lie if I didn't start with the three women that closest to me in my life, um, my wife, uh, my sister and my uh, my mother, um, they are heroes for me for different reasons and for the same reason. Um, I mean, we are in a trying time right now. So for, you know, someone who uh, we just, uh, we, I didn't do anything. Uh, my wife just uh, had our fourth child and to, you know, deal with an infant and go back to work while, you know, in the course of a, of a pandemic, that's heroic. I, you know, that is that is beyond, you know, um, a, you know, a super a superhero effort. Um, my sister, who has always been my inspiration, who's gone back to school to get her doctorate uh, while raising her son, while embodying like everything professionally that I would love to be. She's my heroine. Uh, and my mother, my mother was my first critique partner. She's probably the first one who um, encouraged me to go back down this path of writing like, yes, you don't have to show anyone your work if I'm here to read it if you want me to. And so she became my first editor. Like I said, my first critique partner. She's the one who Fridays would take us to the Martin Luther King Jr. Library in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and allow us to check out as many books as we can read. And I would devour them all by Sunday. And she would be like, Kwame, we're not going again until Friday. And she would she always encouraged me to find a new book, to find a new story. And so I think I'll stop right there because I think there are, are no more important heroes or heroines than the ones that are closest to us to encourage us to become the best that we can be. Okay, okay. Um, we have a question from a group of third graders. Karen writes in, we are at school and my third graders want to know if you could be a superhero, who would you be? Who would I be? Um, <laughs> I think I was in, I think I was in third grade when I created a superhero, uh, by the name of Emok, uh, E-M-A-W-K. And if, and if you recognize it, those are just the letters of my name spelled backwards. Uh, I created a superhero named Emok and, uh, I don't, I, I need to find that story, but if we're talking superheroes that are already created, um, I really like uh, the the powers of Green Lantern, um, and the reason is that it's because Green Lantern, you know, you're only limited by your imagination and the things that he create with the power of his ring, and so I can just imagine all sorts of silly and ridiculous and wonderful um, objects and uh, practical jokes that I create I could create with Green Lantern's ring. So I'll say Green Lantern. Okay. Now this is a comment, um, I think from another teacher, uh, but it's Christy and she says, first, your gum baby voice, perfect. <laughs> Second, thank you for giving my students an actual story featuring African gods and heroes. Well, you are welcome. You are absolutely welcome. I would do the gum baby voice right now, but we did not do sound tests for it. And so it might, you know, go off the register and I don't want to mess up this lovely setup that we have going here. Um, right. But um, one thing that I will say is that 
I do not want to take credit for being the first or one of the only. There are stories out there with um, God, African gods and goddesses, with African American gods and goddesses. I think it is incumbent upon us as adults to go out and find them, to seek them. It'll be hard. It'll be hard, but that is why we have this network. That is why we have libraries and librarians. We should be out there finding these stories for our children. I'm just happy to be able to provide another story for this generation of readers um, to enjoy. Great point. Jashanti asks, is Tristan based off you or someone you know, or is he just a character that reflects parts of you? Um, well, Jashanti, I think that the, the last statement is probably the most accurate. Tristan has parts of me uh, and, and facets of me in, embedded in his character. Um, and I think the easiest and the most obvious one that I like to point to uh, is Tristan is, uh, he has a, a fear of heights. You know, he's just he's just nervous when, um, when he's up high, when he's flying, you know, he's on Ayana's flying raft and they're whizzing about and the only thing, you know, there's no seatbelts, just gum baby saps, oh, you know, fastening him to the raft. And it's a very trying and terrifying time. And I also similarly, uh, I'm not quite fond of heights. Um, it it's it takes a lot of energy for me to get up on a ladder, even if it's just to change a light bulb. You know, you gotta psych your, I gotta psych myself up, motivate myself, promise myself that there will be coffee at the end of it. Um, so with a lot of the characters that I write, they aren't necessarily completely picked up, you know, plucked out of my life or uh, off the street and put into a book, but you'll see that they'll have different aspects of, you know, people that I might've run into or, you know, they might talk like someone that I, I know, even though they don't look anything like them. They have different pieces that are assembled together to make these characters. Okay, okay. Um, Debbie would like to know, Oh, wait just a minute. I lost Debbie's question. Debbie would like to know how many books have you written? Whew. How many books have I written? All right. So if, if I say, um, if I say from right now, at this point in time, how many books have I written? Um, so I have Tristan 1 and Tristan 2. I have um, a third book that has not been published yet. Um, I have a fourth book that um, was recently announced. And then I have, those are the ones that are just currently in the works with publishers. And then books that might not ever see the light of day, um, but I've written to become a better writer, um, I would say maybe three or four. So I would say about eight books in total. And I think you will find that, you know, I think you'll find a similar count or uh, with other writers, you'll see that they have books that they, you know, you might never ever get to read. And that's okay. And it's completely okay if everything you write does not get published because it serves to help you become a better writer. And at the end of the day, we just want our next book to be better than our last book. Right, right. That's good advice for you, for, for some writers out there. Um, there was a question. Seal Ballinger asks, how does it feel to win a Coretta Scott King honor for your first book? Well, Seal, uh, <laughs> it, um, it is truly humbling. It is truly, truly, truly humbling, mind-blowing, and incredible. And I refuse to take all the credit for that because I had a wonderful team. I have wonderful editors, copy editors, publishers, marketers, publicists, um, critique partners, um, friends, family, um, a book, you know, I may have put the words down there, but I didn't create John Henry. I didn't create Anansi. And so to all the people who have told those stories throughout time, you know, they share a part of this honor as well. I just, you know, put the word count in. Okay, speaking of your success, we have a question from Donna. What advice would you give other aspiring Black writers? What advice would I give other aspiring Black writers? Um, I would tell them to, I would just, I would give them the advice that I've probably been trying to give myself over this last two months, three months, six months. And that is that you just have to sit down 
and write your story, right? You have to write the story that is true to yourself and the way that you want to tell it. Um, we are coming upon a time where we are realizing more and more and more the power that um, different stories. I don't want to. I don't want to say. Uh, I hesitate to say. You know, um, um, the the unheard or the the unspoken voices that are out there because you know there people are hearing them and people are speaking. It's whether or not we're choosing to listen. And so I would tell writers. I would tell black writers that you just have to get out there and you have to tell your story. Um, whether or not someone else understands it, that's on them. You have to create for yourself. Don't limit yourself based off of someone else's viewpoint. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tell the story that you know, tell the story that you believe in and make other people believe in it as much as you do. That's, that's what I would probably tell them. Okay. Taylor asks, how long was the process for writing this book? Um, so from the very first moment, the very first scene that I wrote, which actually happens to be the gum baby break-in scene um, that is in chapter three, um, that is the very first scene that I wrote. And then from then until when my wonderful editor, Steph Lurie said, you know what, that's it, that's done. No more revisions. This is off to become an actual paginated book. I would say it was about 18 months. Um, 10 months of that were spent writing a rough draft, and then eight months were spent perfecting it because no matter who you are, no matter how good you are, whether you're a first-time writer or you've been writing for decades, nothing that you write will be perfect the first time. There will be revisions and edits, whether you do it yourself or whether someone else helps you do it. And so that process, it took me a year and a half. Um, and it was a learning process. Um, it was rough at times. It was fantastic and fun at times. Um, but 18 months of my life was spent writing Tristan Strong, Punches a Hole in the Sky. Okay. Um, we have another question from the students. Just a minute, let me get back to it. Karen says that Gabe from her class wants to know how do you come up with the covers of your books? Gay, that is a fantastic question. So um, I cannot draw at all. My artistic skills are limited to uh, wonderful stick figures and I'm very proud of them. Um, and so for we, the, the cover artist for this book and for book two uh, was Eric Wilkerson. Eric Wilkerson, who did a fantastic job. Um, it starts with uh, my editor saying, hey, Kwame, is there a scene that you feel like represents this book or you know, that uh, embodies kind of the themes and the spirit of this book? And if you look at the cover of book one uh, behind me, you'll see you have Tristan Strong and you have John Henry back to back fighting iron monsters which you know, pretty much happens throughout the course of the book. That's what they're doing. They're trying to save themselves and their friends and their family and their country from these iron monsters. Uh, and so we pick this scene and, uh, and then my, my work is done because again, I can't draw. We turn it over to um, our wonderful uh, art director, Tyler and Eric, they get together, they talk about color schemes and they talk about positioning. Um, and it's it is truly a group effort, and then Eric does his his uh, his his fantastic work, and we get the product that you see in front of you. Um, I am extremely happy with the end result. In fact, the very first time I saw that cover, uh, I was still working. I was still at my day job. I got it in an email, and I cried for like ten minutes because it was absolutely exactly what I had envisioned and even more so. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm happy to say that I, I can take 0.5% of the credit for the cover um, and the rest goes to our wonderful art and design team and, and Eric Wilkerson. Wow, that's a really interesting process for that. Um, Michael asks, he's, he says now he's curious, he'd like to know what powers did Emok have? Emok had every power. 
<laughs> Emok had every power. He was unstoppable. He was a force of nature. And that is the problem. I couldn't come up with an obstacle that he could not overcome. So Emok had about three pages in his story where basically it was like, I saved the world and I didn't even have to break a sweat. Emok is the most powerful superhero to never have a story written about him. And maybe one day I'll finish it, but I like the way it ended. Emok number one superhero in the world. I will put him up against anyone because I can I can guarantee that if I had written the story, he would have beaten them. Emark. <laughs> okay. Uh, Marie noticed that you are wearing a Howard University sweatshirt. Um, and she wanted to know if you have any special memories or experiences that you'd like to share about Howard. <sighs> Uh, again, we don't have the time uh, to discuss all of the special memories of Howard. Um, I met, you know, my best friends at Howard. I met my wife at Howard. Um, and it was a truly a revelatory experience, um, the history behind it, um, the the professors. Um, I learned I learned so much outside of class, you know, talking with professors more so than I did in class. Um, being surrounded um, with uh, Black people who come from all walks of life. Again, we are not a monolith. All of our stories are not the same. So being able to exchange about what it was like growing up in Philly and in, in L.A., you know, in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, it was an absolutely unifying and humbling experience. And it's it's something that I wouldn't trade for the world. So much so that in case I got warm, I doubled up and put on the Howard t-shirt so that I could take it off and still maintain and represent for my alma mater. Awesome, awesome. You have represented well. <laughs> <laughs> so Andrea asks, uh, well, she says first that she agrees with Christy that your reading voice is mesmerizing. Oh. You hook us right into your story. I work with many children who listen to audio. Have you or are you considering doing audio for the series? Uh, for the Tristan Strong series, we already have a fantastic narrator. So if you're listening to the audio book, that's not me you're listening to. That is Amir Abdullah, who uh, is our audio book narrator for, for book one and book two and does an absolutely fantastic job. I believe he won an audio award actually for uh, the reading of, of, of book one. Um, I love just, I love doing, um, the, uh, gum baby and, uh, granddad just because they are this complete opposite. One is this gruff, no nonsense, um, uh, old, old black man who, um, it just, you know, he, he knows what he wants and he expects you to know it at the same time. And then gum baby who is, you know, she talks about herself in the third person she sounds like she's ingested helium for, you know, the bulk of her life and she's covered in sap uh, and she is very confident in, in herself and her abilities. So um, I love, you know, when I'm reading my, my story out loud to myself, it gets a little weird because I'm just down here in my office, you know, um, narrating the story back and forth just to an audience of one. And that's me. Um, but for the books, that's Amir Abdullah, who, again, does an absolutely fantastic job. Okay. Um, Lori uh, is with seventh grade students and her seventh grade student Moises wants to know if you like Black Panther. Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. Um, we, me and a group of writer friends, uh, went to see Black Panther. We were on a writing retreat and a part of the, uh, our reward to ourselves for you know doing the work and putting in the writing was we got to go see Black Panther. So I believe it was seven or eight of us. We, we uh, went down in New York. We went down to the theater. We saw it for the first time. I bought the DVD. Um, it was absolutely fantastic, a fantastic movie. Uh, rest in peace to Chadwick Boseman, another um, Howard alumni. Um, the movie was fantastic. The comic book is fantastic. And the stories, you know, the graphic novels, the, the uh, young Black Panther 
They're all incredible. And I cannot wait to see where these stories continue to grow as we get more and more authors that are invested and more and more publishers, um, uh, or more and more publishing support willing to take on and to boost this story of this African superhero uh, to the world. Okay, um, another question from a fourth grade class from Karen. I teach a combination class. Nicholas wants to know, why do you like books so much? Ugh. <laughs> Nicholas, I don't, I don't have time to tell you how much I love books. Um, books are a an escape. Right now, I cannot travel because we are under a pandemic. But when I crack open a book, I am in 18th century West Africa. I am in 9th century China. Uh, I am in the future. Um, so books are an escape for me. Books are a way to uh, live vicariously um, through characters whose stories take us on adventures, on mysteries, on thrillers. Um, books are a way for me to laugh. Books are a way for me to cry, to get angry. Books are a way to confront your own feelings that you didn't know you had. Books are a way to learn about different feelings. Books are a way to empathize and to emphasize. Books are a way for you to relate to someone that looks nothing like you. But through the power of a book, maybe, maybe you can gain an inkling of what it is like to live in their shoes and to live in their body and to see what they're seeing. Books are absolutely powerful. They're transformative from uh, traditional prose books to comic books, to graphic novels, to audio books. All of those books are incredibly, incredibly important. And I just, I don't know. I, I love them. I love books. If you could see my office right now, I'm glad you can't see my office right now because it is very messy because I have books everywhere. That's actually, it's probably dangerous how many books I have towering over me right now, but I love books. Thank you, Nicholas, for reminding me that I love books. Okay, um, we've got time for, I think, a couple more. This one is a comment and a question. Shannon says, my children love Tristan and they really love the audiobook. Getting them to sit down to read though has been a challenge. Any advice for kids who love stories but are somewhat reluctant readers, especially in the age of so many screens? Thanks. Um, yes, 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 yes. So I, I find myself in the role of my mother in finding stories that children love, right? Our goal is we want to find the stories that our children love. And having them sit down and do something, maybe draw, maybe color, maybe help you cook, clean the dishes while we're listening to an audio book, that is a perfectly uh, wonderful way to enjoy a story. Um, and so I think it is incumbent upon us to find the stories that our children love and give them the freedom to enjoy those stories. So whether that story is in a book or the graphic novel version of a book that might lead them back to the original, whether that story is in you know a four page comic spread that again leads them back to another book. It is, un it is incumbent upon us as adults uh, to find the hooks that our children, you know, that, that get our children engaged in reading and different forms of reading. Um, let them explore, let them find the stories that they enjoy and read it along with them. Um, I, I, I just, I remember, you know, this, the, my mother would drop, you know, four or five or six books on, you know, with me and would be like, Hey, do you like this one? And I would try it and I'd be like, eh, you know, this one isn't for me. And I would try another one. And I would try another one until I found one that I liked. And when I found that one I liked, when I found that author, I was 100% committed. I wanted everything that author had written. I wanted book two, book seven. I wanted the other series that had written. So sometimes it is an investment in our children. And one thing that my, uh, my wife and I decided early on is that we are willing to invest in books for our children. And so sometimes it may seem like, hey, that it was a waste of money because we bought that book and they didn't read it. But sometimes they weren't ready to read it. Sometimes they'll come back a year or two years later to read it. I do that. I It took me my favorite book in the world, still to this day, right now is The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemisin. But it took me three times, three, three attempts to read it. The first two times I was like, you know what, this book isn't for me. And the third time I fell in love with it. 
And so it is incumbent upon us to keep trying, keep trying to find those stories that our children enjoy and then let them go wild and enjoy that story. Well, I think that is a perfect place to end. We are out of time. <laughs> Thank you, Kwame Mbalia, for sharing your time with us so generously. We have been speaking to Kwame Mbalia, uh, whose latest book is Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky. You can find his presentation on the children's stage of the National Book Festival at nationalbookfestival.com. Thanks too to our audience out there. And I hope all of you will take the time to explore our many programs and enjoy the remainder of the festival. Music